Hey, thanks for joining us either in person or online. Last week, we kicked off a series called If Then. Have you ever heard the phrase, sometimes God works in mysterious ways? Raise your hand if you've ever heard that. Yeah, we've heard it. We've experienced it. Sometimes things happen in life, and we believe God's in the middle of it, but we're not sure we can make sense of it. We hear that phrase, God works in mysterious ways, and it's real easy in life to get so focused in on the mysterious stuff we don't understand that we ignore the stuff that we do understand. So the whole goal of this series is to acknowledge the mystery. And sometimes the mystery, mysterious ways, or it's also the messiness of life. We want to acknowledge that's there, but we want to lean into the sometimes God works in not so mysterious ways. God works in some if-then type situations. Last week we talked about the law of the farm. If you plant something and take care of it, it will grow. You reap what you sow. If you plant, that's what you'll get. The law of gravity is a great example of that. If you drop something, what will it do? Will it go up or down? Down, it's the law of gravity. It's always at play. And God, that's not a mystery to us. But God says there are certain things in place that work. Now, gravity And farming, that's one thing. Today, we're going to talk about a a principle, an if-then principle, that is probably the most frequent question I get and one of the most frequent frustrations I hear about life. And it feels like it leans a lot more to the mystery side than the law of gravity side. Here's Jeremiah 29.11. Let's read this. For I know the plans I have for you. God says he knows he has plans for whoever he was talking to there. Jeremiah was a prophet. Uh, He actually wrote uh, two books of the Bible, Jeremiah and Lamentations. He was a prophet that had to go and give a lot of bad news or, hey, God says you need to do a U-turn, recalculating, change of direction, and it did not get received very well. He lived through uh, five different kings uh, leading the people of Judah And uh, only one of them was a really good one. And the people made a lot of bad choices. And the reality is a lot of people hear this this, this verse, and for some people, it's their life verse. For I know the plans I have for you. What kind of plans? Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. And they go, that's my verse. What happens next for the group of people that heard this? It did not go well. As a matter of fact, if if you ever have read the book of Daniel, where the Babylonians came in and capture all the people from Judah and take them off, including Daniel. That happened right after this. Like, when, we, when life doesn't go the way we want, we think, is God with me? D- did he plan this for me? Is this my deal? Is this his deal? It gets really confusing, and when things happen like that, We go, well, I'm not experiencing something that feels like it's prospering me. Something feels like it's harming me. I feel like I don't have hope. I feel like I question my future. Suddenly we feel lost in this kind of idea of, well, how do I know God's plans and did I miss it? Is this part of it? It's really, really challenging. Today what we want to simply talk about is this idea of the the divine hearing principle. Not only does God know the plans he has for you, you can hear it. You can hear not just God's plans, but you can hear God's voice. It's a promise throughout Scripture, and it wasn't just for guys like Jeremiah who said, I'll listen and tell you what he said. It's for you as a follower of Jesus. It goes on to say this, verse 12. Then, if you want to know his plans, here's the if then. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. So I can actually call on God, and he'll hear me. That's great. But can I hear him? Look at verse 13. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. If you will call upon me, if you will seek me, then you will find me if you seek me with all your heart. And for some of us, we've let our circumstances be the idea, I'm just going to let what happens to me be the voice of God. If it's a good day, God spoke to me that he loves me. If it's a bad day, God spoke to me, he does, he's mad at me. And we kind of bounce around by our circumstances. Or we bounce around by the voice of different people in our lives. 
But what he says is not only can you hear from God, you can actually find him and have this relationship with him. But you need to seek him not just to hear the plans. You seek him to know him and to follow him. Mark Batterson says, hearing the voice of God is the solution to a thousand problems. I don't know what your challenges are in life right now, but I really do believe you learning to listen and hear from God, which he's promised to do, is probably a key solution to whatever you're navigating. The challenge is, we typically want to seek God when we have the challenge, not when we're in a good place. If things are prospering me, I don't tend to seek him as much. And for this group of people, Jeremiah told them, like, it's not going to go well for you. He called it, ninety. he said, 90 years, you're going to be living in exile. And he didn't live long enough to tell him, I told you so. Not that I think he would have. But he said, look, this is what's coming. If you would just listen and follow God, the future could be so different. But Jeremiah had a really tough job. And then he kind of gives us God's phone number. Jeremiah 33.3. Call to me and I will answer you and tell you great and unsearchable things you do not know. There are things in life that are mysterious. I think there are things in life that we won't know in this life what the deal, how it turns out, why it is the way it is, why that happened. I think there's lots of mystery. But not as much as you think. There are great and unsearchable things that you don't know. But God says, if you call upon me, I'll answer you, and I will tell you. I will speak to you. It's what we're calling this week the divine hearing principle. God speaks, and you can hear him. That, that's a truth. And when you hear that, if somebody came up to you and said, God spoke to me today, what would go on in your mind? I'll, I'll, I'll kind of say for me, if someone tells that to me, I'm either like, you're really godly or you're really crazy. Because there have been times in history when someone said, God told me. And then what they said next was like, really? (laughs) All right. This is not an easy thing. But I don't think that has to do with God's ability to speak. I think it has our ability to listen and our willingness to listen. But I promise this is not just for the super godlies, the Jeremiah's, the prophets of the world. It's not for the people who are crazy and, you know, think that they're the Messiah. Like, it's like in between for normal everyday people, he tells you, if you will call to him, then he will answer you. And he will tell you great and unsearchable things that you don't know. There are things you don't know now that you could. Is he going to tell you everything? Probably not. But that's for your own good. He's not holding something back but this is what he has planned for you. And so what I want to do is give you some helps of how you can better listen to try and hear God's voice. So how do we do it? How do we call? How would he listen for the answer? Another guy in the Old Testament, Samuel, was told, hey, here's what I want you to do if you think God may be speaking. It's, and it's a very simple prayer. If you made this your prayer this week, I think it will help you turn up the volume of trying to hear God's voice, which actually isn't turning up the volume of his voice. It's turning down the volume of everything else in your life, including what's going on in yours. Here's here's how Samuel prayed. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. What if you just made that your prayer this week? And, you know, a lot of times when we pray, it's us talking to God. That is a truth. That is a reality of life. If you speak, he will hear you. The God of the universe hears your prayers. So talk to him. Talk to him about everything. But in any relationship in your life, if all you do is talk and you never listen, how will that relationship go? But even beyond that, if all I do is talk and never listen, that relationship will suffer. But he's the one that has the stuff to say that I desperately need to hear. Why wouldn't I spend more time listening than speaking When I pray, and if this was your prayer, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Here's how I often mess it up. Instead, I flip around and say, listen, Lord, for your servant is speaking. God, I've got something to say. God, I need something right now. And he tells us to do that. Cast your cares upon me. 
Tell me what's on your mind. Pray about everything. Like, like it's, we're told to do that. It's okay. But that's not the only thing that prayer is. As a matter of fact, if you would spend more time listening than just speaking, I wonder how different our lives would be in terms of knowing the direction, knowing the plans he has for us, knowing how much he cares for us, knowing how he wants to redirect us. We don't like that as much. I'd rather just have the answer. So listen, Lord, for your servant speaking. But he was told to pray. This is a great prayer. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. What if you said that at the end of your prayers instead of amen? What if, by saying amen, you're just saying that, amen. God, I agree with everything I just said, but now I want to hear from you. And a lot of times is we've been treating God like we've been on a phone call and we're t- telling and we're asking and we're thanking. Maybe we're doing really good things. We're worshiping him. Hey, God, you're just so awesome. All right, we'll talk to you later. Why can't I hear from God? Well, we put the phone down. We're not actively listening on the phone anymore. You can hear from God. So are you listening? What are you doing in your life to actively listen? God spoke in many unique ways recorded in the Bible and throughout history. I mean, angels. Spoke to Moses through a burning bush. Even once spoke through a donkey, which gives me a lot of hope that maybe God could speak through me. Like, like God spoke in a lot of unique ways. And a lot of times what we do is we think, well, Moses had the burning bush. Why can't I just get that? Well, Moses only got it once. And Moses was asked to go and do something very intimidating and challenging that could have cost him his life and lead millions of people who are whiners and complainers who went on a 40-year road trip that was absolutely no fun. And they actually never got to their destination until they all died and the next generation came in. Like, do you really want the burning bush now? Like, when, you, when God speaks through a burning bush, it's usually life-changing for a lot of people and very unsettling. Like, don't make the uncommon what you're looking for in the everyday. Yes, sometimes God will use extraordinary things to speak with you. But I think sometimes it's in the ordinary moments of life that he speaks. And another guy in the Old Testament heard from God this way in 1 Kings 19, 12. There were all kinds of things going on, earthquakes and fires, but God was not in that. After the fire came a gentle whisper, and that's where God spoke to him, a gentle whisper. You know, when someone whispers... What does that do for the conversation? Like if someone whispers, you kind of have to lean in. And if they whisper, it just kind of does something different to the conversation. And God's voice is described as a gentle whisper. And the power of the whisper is it gets our attention. It requires our attention. It connects us deeper. We lean in and we connect. And I think that's why God sometimes isn't just yelling and screaming in your life banging drums and fire and earthquakes and hey, hey, hey. Sometimes he's just whispering and he's waiting for you to lean in and listen. We live in a very noisy world. And I don't think the solution for hearing from God is asking him to turn up the volume of his life. It's to turn down the volume in ours. What are you doing in your life to try and quiet the noisy world the noisiness of your world. What are you doing to leverage the power of silence so you can hear from God? One thing I really do believe is I think God often speaks the loudest when we're the quietest. Because being quiet requires a change of pace for me. It requires some activity and participation from me. It re- requires some faith. Like, I'm going to be quiet, and, 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 and I want to hear from him. Like, there's just a lot about that when I do that, that really leaning in, it says something to God, and it positions myself to hear from him. And being quiet is anything but passive. It's proactive listening. It's active listening. So the question I want to ask you really to think about today is, is God's voice the loudest voice in your life? Is God's voice the loudest voice in your life? Because there are many voices that get our attention. There's a lot of voices in our life that we pay attention to. 
There's a lot of voices in our life that we don't want to pay attention to, we don't want to hear, but they're going on. We live in a noisy world, in a world with a lot of voices that think they have something to say, and some of them actually do, but there's so many going at once, it's just chaos and confusion, and we wonder why we feel kind of lost and disoriented at times. But if you had to say, who had the loudest voice in your life, would you say that it's God's? And if the answer is no, then that's the problem. That's not just a problem. It is the problem. Because the God of the universe created you. And the God of the universe says, I've got plans for you. If you can't hear those, how will you discover them? And if God says, I want to know you and have a relationship with you and you can't hear him, how, what kind of relationship will that be? See, some of us, we just need to rethink what prayer is. Prayer is not just talking to God. It's also listening. As a matter of fact, I mean, some of us have been given this advice in our relationships. Do less talking, do more listening. And usually those relationships go a lot better. What if we just did that with God? We did a lot less talking and a lot more listening. Keep doing the talking. He asks us to do that. But do more listening. Be quiet and lean in. And listen, and then, and here's the other thing that I've learned in my life. Not just listen to what God has to say, but actually do what he has to say. You know, the Latin word for the word obey means to give an ear to, to to give ear, to listen with the intent of doing. I think sometimes in my life, I've heard what God wanted me to do. I just didn't do it. And then, and then I wondered why I'm not hearing from God as much anymore. 1 Samuel 3, 9, again, it's speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. I'm not, not just listening to acquire information. I'm listening for you to give me direction, to tell me who am I, how do you want me to live, what do you want me to do? And there's a difference between hearing and listening. Hearing is, is I, 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 it, it registered. Listening is active and responsive. I'm doing something. And selective listening is, is a challenge too because sometimes it's just what's on me telling God what's on my mind instead of listening to hear what's on his. Hearing from God is hugely important. But it's a mystery at times. But not as much as we think. So here's three big ways that we can hear from God. Here's the first one, through the Bible. Well, why is that a way we can hear from God? We need to understand it's not a book about God. It's a book from God to point us to him. Here's several verses that can help us understand kind of what we talk about when we talk about the Bible. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Here's a promise. This book, which isn't just one book, it's 66 books written over several thousand years by numerous people, who, was vet, who were vetted and people checked it again and again and go, is this really trustworthy? All scripture is God breathed. It got its start with him. But it's not just from God, it's useful for us. And it's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training, and equipping. I want the good promises. I want the stuff that makes me feel good. I don't want rebuking. I don't want correcting. But everything God has to say is useful and beneficial. And it gets its start with him. Here's another verse. Hebrews 4.12. The word of God is alive and active. The first followers of Jesus believed that. Jesus really leaned on a lot. And when he was tempted throughout his life, he would keep quoting scripture again and again. And it's not just something that was spoken long ago that say that's good information. It's something much bigger than that. It's alive and active. And it penetrates the inside of who you are. Judging thoughts and attitudes of the heart. And that's not always the area we want to listen to, but God says, I want to do something new in you. Do you trust me? Well, how can we trust something written by guys a couple thousand years ago? Here's how Peter described it. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. Is he saying that's never happened in life? Absolutely not. They even call out some people at times. They're saying, you're speaking for God, but it's very clear that you're not. Prophecy never had its origin in the human will, uh, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. 
that God was very engaged in getting this to us because he believed it would be good for us. It would be helpful. And then here's an amazing promise that a lot of times I'll even read or think about even before I get up here and, and realize that this pressure's not on me. It's really on God to accomplish what he's doing. Here's what the prophet Isaiah said. When God's bringing his word in scripture forward, he says, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve, achieve the purpose for which I sent it. You know, Jeremiah, that's like 4,000 years ago. Jesus is teaching in the first followers of Jesus that we have in the New Testament 2,000 years ago. And over time, we think maybe it lost its power. Or over time, we thought maybe it lost its effectiveness. But no, God says, no, it's from me. It's living and active. I'm involved with it. This is not just a book about God. And it will, it will not return to me empty. It will accomplish what I desire. It has a purpose. And God says, you can understand my voice better by leaning into this. The truth and value of God's voice does not diminish with the distance or time. It's still his and it still serves his purposes. So the key to understand if hearing God's voice and really leveraging the Bible for that is not to read about God, but engage with God as I read it. And again, think about the principle of the farm. Is this being planted in my life? Because if it's planted... And God says, it'll accomplish his purposes. I can trust him with the harvest it brings in my life. I should leverage the principle of the farm with this. What you plant will grow. Well, the Holy Spirit is very involved with Scripture, and it's the Holy Spirit that's very involved with us too. We don't need, we don't need somebody else to help us do that. When you give your life to Jesus, he promises he gives his life to you and will live his life in you and through you through the Holy Spirit. Here's what Jesus said. Jesus told his disciples, hey, I'm leaving. And they did not like that. We don't like it when anybody leaves, but, I mean, this was Jesus. And he had been with them, and they were very thrown by how he said he would die. They didn't understand the rising again. They were very confused, but when, there was no concept in their mind what they thought, Jesus leaving is good for us. But Jesus said this in John 16. Very truly I tell you, it's good that I'm going away. Here's why. Unless I go away... The advocate, that's the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I go, I'll send him to you. It was a promise. But it wasn't a promise just for them. Verse 8. When he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong and sin and righteousness and judgment about sin. Because people do not believe in me about righteousness. Because I am going to the Father where you can see me no longer. And about judgment because the price of this world now stands condemned. Boy, that's really bad news. What does it say next? I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak of his own. He will speak only what he hears. And he will tell you what is yet to come. This is why we can trust what Peter had to say. Because it wasn't Peter, it was the Holy Spirit through Peter. He said, you're not going to remember some of this stuff? I'll help you remember. I'll speak through you. I won't just inspire you like, wow, that's, that's a really good song. I feel like writing. No, it's inspired, like carried along by the Holy Spirit. But the promise of the Spirit guiding you is just as relevant. God promises that in you dwells his Holy Spirit. And if the God of the universe is in you, you can hear. You can follow. He can speak to you as well. You can hear. That is one of the things that helps us understand what, God, what God's plans are. But it's bigger than his plans. It's anything that God has to say to you. And the key is that, believing that promise that you were with me. God, you were with me. And when I read the Bible, it helps me recognize his voice to recognize that's not just bad pizza or a bad idea or it's not my voice because sometimes we play the ventriloquist game with God. God's speaking to me, but it's really me speaking. But I've got a little God ventriloquist dummy and I'm thinking, oh, it's God's voice. Again, it's the principle of the farm. If I put God's word in my life, it will help me discern the voice of God when he speaks to my life. And it's... 
when I put Christ in my life through his Holy Spirit, it's a relationship with God, not just knowledge of God. I'll be able to hear him better. So there's the Bible, there's the Holy Spirit, and then there's this. Wise and godly people. And when there's wise and godly people in my life, I can hear God's voice better. Or they can help me recognize God's voice or recognize God's activity. I mean, there's the wisdom side of it. Proverbs says it a couple times. It says this. Plans fail for lack of counsel, but with many advisors, they succeed. It's just wiser to have good people, wise people, godly people in my life. (coughs) Also says this in Proverbs. Where there is strife, there is pride. But wisdom and found is found in those who take advice. When I listen to wise and godly people in my life, I'll be able to discern God's plans and God's activity and things like that. But there's something about this powerful connection between wisdom and godliness. As a matter of fact, very early on in the church, there was this huge argument about what do we do about this certain issue, and they weren't sure what to do. And one person didn't step and said, God told me, but he didn't tell any of y'all, here's what we need to do. It was actually, they used to leverage the power of God's Holy Spirit and wise and godly counsel together. And then James, the brother of Jesus, who's leading the church, stands up and says, here's our decision. And he says this in Acts 15. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. Sometimes we can best hear God because we have others saying, Am I, do you think I'm hearing him right on this? I don't just want your opinion. I want you to help me discover what do you think God is doing here? I want people in my life that can say, boy, it sure feels pleasing to the Holy Spirit and to us that this is the right thing to do. Who is that for your life? Because finding those people in your life is critical to help you grow spiritually. And you growing spiritually is critical to helping others experience that. Because as we grow in our faith, Paul said this to the church in Ephesus. He said, as we all grow in our faith and do our unique part and bring our unique gifting to the community of believers, to your community, he says, here's the benefit. Ephesians says this. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves, blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. We can get tossed up. We live in a noisy world. That has a lot to say and a lot to sell. And they're getting our voice in our head and there's stuff going on. And we can feel tossed around. And one day I feel this and the next day I feel this. He goes, look, if you are growing spiritually and using your giftedness together, instead there's a better way. Speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect a mature body of him, Jesus, who is the head. That is Christ. When we are growing in our faith, And we speak to one another truth and love, both. God can help us hear his voice and discover his plans. There's this if-then principle that we're talking about in this series. Yes, there's a lot of mystery in hearing God's voice. There's a lot of mystery in discovering what his plans are. But not as much as we think. That God has something to say, and you can hear it but it requires you turning down the voice, your own, turning down the noise going on around you. Not just talking, but listening and really saying, hey, listen, Lord, Uh, not listen, Lord, because your servant is speaking, but speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. It requires that kind of posture. Have you done that this last week? Well, last week's gone. Forget about that. Let's talk about next week. What are you doing this week to turn down the noise, to lean in and listen? Because if we listen, The promise is then we will hear from God. Are you listening? You know, in Hebrews we're told, hey, when the Holy Spirit speaks, when God speaks to you, don't harden your hearts. Don't harden your hearts. Because over time, if God speaks to us, and we just acknowledge it, we're like, I don't want to do that. Or we don't, live out what he tells us to do, to obey, to give ear with the purpose of living it out. Eventually, if we don't listen to what he has to say, he'll stop speaking. Or at least we won't be able to hear him as well. There's just something valuable about listening and doing 
that puts me in a place where I can hear him better. Because if you aren't willing to listen to everything God has to say, you eventually won't hear anything he has to say. It's not so much that he has nothing to say, but that we're not listening. And again, Mark Batterson says, hearing the voice of God is a solution to a thousand problems. I don't know what your solution is right now. But are you listening to God? Are you trying to discern his voice? Not just for the solution to your problem, but for your connection with your creator. This week, spend time being quiet. Listen. Jeremiah said, you will, told us the promise of God that you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Connect to God's word. Practice the presence of God that he's with you every moment. Spend time with godly people. Try to focus. Listen. Be quiet. And say yes to what God has to say even before you know what he said. And as, in all the mystery and messiness of life, focus more on what you do know rather than the stuff that you don't. And make this week an experiment and just trying to listen from God. And putting this together, it's one of those deals, and it happens from time to time, where it was one of those deals where like, this is a better series than a sermon. It's the most frequent question I get. I honestly get this question a lot. I, I'm not, I just can't hear God's voice, or I'm struggling, or how do I know it's really God's voice and not bad pizza, or kind of what I want to do, or what my mother-in-law wants me to do. Like, how do I discern it? So next year, we're going to do a whole series on this. And here's what I'd like from you. I would love to hear from you about what's worked for you. What's helped you in this area? Or where have you struggled in this area? Because honestly, your input, together, we can put together some stuff that could help all of us. Because I do believe we can hear from God. I don't believe it's easy. But I think that's more on us than it does on Him. But if we made it our goal, God, we want to grow in this ability to hear from you. I think there's wisdom among all of us that we could share and wisdom throughout history that we can look at, that we could grow in this area. Do we want to? Because it's kind of scaring if you know, I want to hear what God has to say and say yes before I even do it. it makes me a little nervous. What's he going to ask of me? But again, if I, I don't think I'd get this question over and over and over again if so many of us really didn't want to hear from him. So I would love your feedback and input on that. Another thing that could really help you is, you know, groups at Live Oak, we believe it, uh, that life happens best uh, in, in circles, not in rows. We're better connected together. We have women's groups, men's groups, mixed groups, college groups. We have all these groups, and they're, most of them are starting this week. Some are ongoing that have been meeting. But we have a lot that are starting this week, and if you're not connected to a group, I can't guarantee that you're going to step in there and suddenly you're going to discover God's plans for your life. But it gives you a better shot at it. Life is better connected. And communities are built over time, and small groups aren't activities to attend. They're communities to build where relationships are there. And so if you're not doing it through a group at Live Oak, like, where are you doing this? Who are your wise and godly people that you're investing in? And how could you think about, hey, a group might not just be something that helps me hear God's voice, but maybe God could use me to help others hear it. We're a big believer in small groups. You can learn more and sign up at events on our app and website through the digital bulletin, I encourage you to be in a group and bring your best self to those groups of saying, I want to hear from God. I want others to hear from God. I want to help us move forward in our story, and I believe God could use me. Let's pray together. God, I do pray for the small groups that are starting this week at Live Oak and groups that have been ongoing. I pray for the communities that are represented, not in official small groups, but these relationships we have with people in our lives. God, thanks that you put people in our lives um, for a purpose. I pray you'd use the people in my life. I pray they'd be godly and wise. They would help me hear your voice and follow you better and grow to be the person you created me to be. I pray that for all of us. God, thanks that the most important relationship in our life is you through your Holy Spirit, that you promised you were with us. I pray that we'd invest in that relationship this week and we'd spend more time listening and less time talking, but we wouldn't stop talking. And God, thanks for the gift of scriptures. God, thanks for the people that have died uh, to give it to us, people like William Tyndale and so many people that, that sacrificed their life because they thought it was important that it got passed on. I pray for those people in parts of the world right now where it's illegal to own a Bible. I pray you'd help them find a way to connect to your word, but thanks that you've made it available to us. Help us not to neglect it this week. God, we would just say this week, speak, 
because we're listening. Help us to hear from you and help us grow and help each other do that. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thanks for being here. If you'd like to talk, we'll be down at the front.